believe that there are some keys to getting prayers answered in the spirit. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you are tired of prayers being unanswered, you need to pay attention to what I'm preaching to you tonight because I'm going to give you something that gives you a key on how to get prayers answered from God. There was a very powerful prophet that lived back in the 50s and 60s, died way too young. His name was Verbal Bean. He was a very powerful man of God. He was a man of prayer. He, he was a powerful man of prayer. He said there were two types of prayers that God answers. He said there are two types of praying that will get God's attention. He said the first type of prayer that God answers is a memorial prayer. It's something that you pray about over and over and over and then God answers it. He said like Cornelius when he prayed so many times that the angel of the Lord said your prayer and your giving has come up as a memorial before God. He said it was like like this he said if a man wanted to buy a suit but could not afford the suit he would go into the suit store with the money he had and put the suit on layaway with the funds that he had next time he got paid he would put some more funds down on the suit he would not leave with the suit he would leave without the suit each time he went in to make a payment but the more payments he made on the suit when he could make them there would become a day when he would finally pay off the suit and when the last payment was made, he could take what he had been paying for home with him. He said, that's how it is in your prayer life. You can be praying about something over and over and over and not take the answer home. If you keep praying and you keep believing, there's going to come a day when you bring the answer home with you because you've paid it in full. <laughs> Hallelujah. I am taking advantage of old fashioned day. I don't particularly enjoy wearing ties, so I didn't really have to be persuaded too much uh, to be able to preach without a tie. That's a joy. Have you ever seen preachers loosen their tie and it's about half hanging off while they're preaching? That means it's really not comfortable to wear a tie while you're preaching. But that's our culture. Uh, I really haven't had that privilege too much. I'm in the process of starting a new church in North Austin, Texas, and I told my church I was considering starting a new doctrine that we shouldn't wear ties uh, to church, uh, since I was starting from scratch, maybe I could get away with it, but I haven't quite done that yet. I have had an opportunity to preach in the country of Yugoslavia a few years back, and uh, some of their old-timers have a doctrine against wearing ties. They feel like it's for show, for ornamentation, too worldly, shouldn't wear it. So, of course, not to offend them, we I didn't wear my tie all the time I preached there. Amen. I'd like to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to take advantage of Old Fashioned Day in another way because I want to teach on a subject that maybe everybody knows all about, but I never seem to hear much teaching on it. So maybe we need to go back a few years. They tell me some of the preachers that have been around for a while and some of those who are raised in Pentecost with preachers' fathers, that they go back to the, they know the first generation of the apostolic movement. They tell me that doctrine used to be the staple theme of much preaching. Even when you had a revival or a tent meeting, uh, and we typically expect a revival just to deal with, well, sometimes we think it deals with maybe an emotional pull or, or some unusual twist on Scripture that will excite the people's attention. But they said for revivals they'd preach on oneness, on the new birth, on, on all kinds of subjects that sometimes we think are too much doctrine. Well... There's another subject that I think is maybe doctrinal or typically Pentecostal or traditionally Pentecostal that we all know about and we all pay heed to and we all strive for. And even in our day, the charismatic movement has tried to draw a lot of attention to, although sometimes not in a very scriptural way, it seems to me. And that's the gifts of the Spirit. When's the last time you heard a Bible lesson on the gifts of the Spirit? Well, in most cases, people I've asked that question to say years or never. So at the risk of seeming to uh, give to you something you already know that won't be exciting to you, I'm going to give you a Bible lesson on the gifts of the Spirit. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians 12, 31. <clears throat> I hope this will set the tone for what we have to say today. But covet earnestly the best gifts, 
and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And here in this verse, I have, we find both of the emphases which I want to bring forth today to desire eagerly the best gifts. And yet, he says, there's something more excellent. If you read the whole context of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, you find out what he's talking about. He's certainly not saying, uh, well, ignore the gifts. Uh, I've thought of something better. But you read in 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, and how often that's referred to. I've used it in weddings. Uh, you use it in all kinds of settings, and I think it's appropriate. But we must not lose sight of where it was placed originally, right in between two chapters on the spiritual gifts. And the point is very clear. We need spiritual gifts in our midst. But more than spiritual gifts, we need spiritual gifts that are exercised in love. And that, I believe, is what he meant by the more excellent way. Not saying, well, let's discard the spiritual gifts, but he says the better way. Rather than just seeking spiritual gifts, the better way is to seek to exercise the spiritual gifts in love. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, exercising gifts in love. Exercising gifts in love. Now, let's establish the availability of the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm particularly referring to the list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, 9, and 10. However, just let me say, I think that list is illustrative or it gives examples. I'm not necessarily sure that it's an exclusive list. I'm not sure you can just pigeonhole every move of God's Spirit into one of those categories. And I'm not necessarily sure that we're supposed to. Let me just kind of share some of my idea or philosophy about the exercise of spiritual gifts and and you can judge for yourselves whether it seems to be scriptural or whether it corresponds with your experience. But rather than going around saying, well, I have this gift and I have that gift and I have the other gift, I think what the Lord wants us to do and what the Apostle Paul was trying to tell us to do is to seek a move of God's Spirit. Be sensitive to the Spirit. Open your heart to the Spirit. Let God use you as the occasion arises. And whether it precisely fits somebody's definition of the word of wisdom or the discerning of spirits or this, that, and the other, it's not really the, the, the issue. I think for the purposes of study and increasing our awareness, it's good to sit down and give a definition so that we can be more attuned to the Spirit. But I don't think we have to pigeonhole God's work. And rather than saying, well, I want this gift or I want that gift or, or I've got this gift and I've got that gift, I think if we would let God use us, whatever the situation demands, He can use us. And maybe it's the word of wisdom, or maybe it's the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom put together. Or maybe it's somebody's definition of word of wisdom and somebody else's definition of word of knowledge. But as long as it gets the job done, that's what's important. I was uh, speaking on the spiritual gifts one at a Bible college once, and a young man came to me. His father had a, an outstanding, well-known spiritual ministry. And he shared some of his frustration. He says, I, I just don't seem to have the same kind of ministry as my father, and I feel so inadequate and, and so helpless. I said, don't worry about trying to find a certain type of gift or trying to imitate a certain type of style. I said, give yourself to God. You feel the call of God upon you. You feel the anointing of God. Well, pray and preach. Make yourself available. Say, God, use me in whatever capacity you can. I think, really, when he says, covet earnestly the best gifts... There's a lot of debate over which gifts are the best. I heard somebody say one, a long time ago, and I don't even remember who it was, but I think it's probably the most accurate explanation. The best gifts are the gifts that are needed at a particular time. You can argue, well, this gift is important, that gift's important. But when you're facing a crisis, or when you're facing a need, when you're facing a soul that's slipping into eternity, or, or you're facing a person that that is ready to respond to God, whatever gift is suitable for that moment, whatever gift will get the job done, that is the best gift. And so rather than just pigeonholing or rather than focusing on one or the other and making it a favorite, I think if we would ask the Lord, use us, Lord, we want to get to a place of spiritual understanding and spiritual sensitivity that any of the gifts could operate in our midst according to your will and the need at that time. And that's what I think we need to strive for. I believe that the gifts of the Spirit are available to every Spirit-filled group of people. 
on the local level because that's where the need is, right? I once heard of, uh, I attended an a, a international meeting for charismatic and Pentecostal leaders and Brother Hall and I were invited to represent the United Pentecostal Church. We went and one night, the, uh, you know, just to find out what's going on and to represent our views. One night, they had a Roman Catholic minister. Actually, he's the preacher to the Pope. He's the chaplain of the papal household. And uh, he's supposed to be a charismatic of some sort. And so he was presenting his views of the spiritual gifts. And he said, you know, there are different kinds of gifts throughout the body of Christ. So as long as someone in that body exercises a charismatic gift, that makes the body charismatic. In other words, he says, if, if not all will speak in tongues, not all will exercise a gift, but as long as someone does somewhere, then that means the, the church is a charismatic church. Well, I don't really agree with that. It somehow doesn't comfort me. It, it pleases me to hear reports of revival, say, in Ethiopia. It pleases me, encourages me to hear that someone in this church gave a message in tongues. But somehow that does not satisfy me. It's not enough to belong to the United Pentecostal Church and say, well, in the United Pentecostal Church there are healings. In the United Pentecostal Church people speak in tongues. In the United Pentecostal Church people have a word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. Somehow I think it needs to go not just to the international level or the national level or the state level or the district or the section, but somehow we need a move of God in each location. And that's where I believe God intends for the gifts of the Spirit to operate. Furthermore, I will say that I believe that level or the district or the section, but somehow we need a move of God in each location. And that's where I believe God intends for the gifts of the Spirit to operate. Furthermore, I will say that I believe that God, potentially anybody that's full of the Holy Spirit, could exercise a spiritual gift. Now, we know from 1 Corinthians 12 that God distributes the gifts as He wills. So we don't expect everyone at the same time to exercise a certain gift. It's, not just, it's just not realistic. But in potential, anyone could exercise a gift. Now, when you talk about this, a lot of people ask, well, are the gifts resident in the church or are the gifts resident in the individual? And it, the Bible does say that God gives to every man or to everyone gifts as He wills. But they are gifts of the Spirit. I think the focus should be not on the individual, but on the Spirit of God. And it's no point in me bragging, well, I have this gift and that gift and the other gift. I think the Spirit distributes the gifts as He wills, as the occasion demands, and as people's hearts are yielded to the Spirit. Now, it is true that often the same person will exercise the same gift many times. I think that's not so much that they have an exclusive franchise on that gift for that church, but it's that they have learned how to yield to the Spirit. They have faith in that dimension, and so the Lord will use them over and over again. But that is not to say that someone else could be used in that area as the need arises. And so rather than focusing it on the people that possess the gift, I think we should focus on the Spirit and realize that in potential... Any Spirit-filled believer can exercise a gift of the Spirit as God wills. I think we must place the emphasis that God is the source. The Spirit is the source. And it's God's will, not our will. It's not a gift for me to exercise at my will. It's God's gift to me that is to be exercised at His will. I read in the Charisma magazine, a charismatic publication, they they had somebody advertising his ministry. They so typical. They always seem to advertise a person's ministry, so and so ministries. That's the typical name of their type of operation. But it said this man has all the nine gifts of the spirit. And I thought, what a boast! I don't really think the gifts of the spirit are in the possession of an individual like that. It just struck me wrong. However, I got to thinking about things that I've seen in my own ministry, I, I got to, and I asked my mother, I got to talking to her over the years, I said, if you think about it, would you say that most or all of the gifts of the Spirit have been exercised in the course of your ministry? She never really thought about that, but as we went one by one and began to define the word of wisdom, she began to think of an occasion 
where the word of wisdom was manifested, either in her life or, or my father's life. And come to think of it, after it was all said and done, she said, yes, we haven't had all those gifts manifested all the time, but over the course of my, our ministry, we have seen all the gifts of the Spirit in operation as the occasion demands. I don't say they have all nine gifts of the Spirit in that sense, but I say they have the Spirit. And if they have the Spirit, whatever the Spirit has is available to them in the course of ministry. And I think that's the best way to look at it. We realize that not all of us are going to be used in the same capacity. We're going to be used in different ways. But what a joy to know and a comfort to know that when the need arises, we can reach up to God and there's no limit what God can do in us and through us and to us as He wills. Now, why do I believe that this is true? Well, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and you look at the very uh, place where the epistle is addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, this letter is written unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, we believe as a matter of faith that the Bible is inspired for, for all of us, but isn't it nice to see this explicitly stated, that this letter is written to the church at Corinth, but not only to that one local assembly, but to all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means the, this letter of promise and instruction is written specifically to you and to me. It's written to every local congregation. And that's why I believe that the teachings contained in that letter are not just for a church at one time in history, or not just for the universal church, but for every group of believers. No matter how large or how small your church may be, I think it's important to seek God for the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit so that we can be effective in reaching our community. And here is the scriptural basis for doing so. Verse 7 explains the purpose, or at least in part, the purpose of this epistle. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, I'm writing to you to instruct you, to encourage you, to open your understanding so that you will not lack any gift. Remember, this is written to a local congregation. I don't want you to lack any gift as you wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, people like the Church of Christ or your dispensationalist Baptists that say the days of miracles are over and spiritual gifts cannot occur in the church, well, they're wrong. Because the gifts are to last till the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that helps explain chapter 13 when it says, When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away. And it gives examples of tongues and prophecy and knowledge cease. Well, we still have need of all those gifts today. But when that which is perfect is come, at the second coming of Christ, at the establishment of His kingdom, we won't need those gifts to mediate the Spirit from the spirit world to our world, but we'll be in direct contact with the Lord Himself. But until that time, we need to seek after the gifts in the church. Well, as I stated a moment ago, I'm in the process of trying to start a church, and I'm working part-time as the associate editor in St. Louis, but I moved to the city of Austin to establish a church, and I uh, started with my family. I have five now, counting my little baby that was just born, so we've already had church growth. Uh, praise the Lord. And uh, my wife's parents, her mother's in the church, her father attends, and so we're praying he'll be our first convert. And, and then my wife's grandparents. That was our nucleus to start with. <clears throat> and uh, we're using a building that belongs to another church. We're using it for Sunday afternoon and midweek service. And then we're also having a prayer meeting in my home. And the Lord began to really move in the prayer meeting. That's proven to be one of the most effective tools we've had. We've had first-time visitors come straight to the prayer meeting, which I didn't necessarily expect that, but the Lord has moved in their lives. We've had one to repent and uh, several others to be really stirred by the prayer meeting. But the Spirit of God began moving in that prayer meeting. Just We'd had a handful of people, maybe 10, 15. We've had up to 25. But I could tell the Lord was wanting to move in a, in a one certain time, in, in tongues and interpretation. But it seems the people were 
You know, we had some that were didn't really know exactly what to do, and then we, all in all, it was a new group and, and not really sure of themselves, and so I began to talk to them about that. In fact, I even taught some on the gifts of the Spirit. And then it's happened sometime later in one of our prayer meetings that my wife's grandmother gave a beautiful message in tongues, my wife interpreted. And I thought that was very interesting because my wife's grandmother is in her 70s. She's been in church for many, many years. But never one time in all those years has she been used as far as the gifts of the Spirit or uh, giving a public message in tongues. But what I was teaching came to pass. You see, she had been member, a member of established churches over the years, large congregations, she didn't really feel adequate. She didn't feel needed. Others that maybe were more uh, vigorous in their pursuit of spiritual gifts or, or had been used in various capacities, she was content to enjoy the blessings of God upon the congregation. Everything was fine. But now, starting a brand new effort, there's really very few people even understanding what's going on or, or even qualified. But that doesn't restrict what God wants to do. And that doesn't restrict what needs to be done. And so as we begin to seek God for revival, to seek Him for a move of the Spirit, God started trying to move in ways perhaps that people had not seen before in their own lives. But the point is this, you don't have to call in an expert who has a certain gift to do the certain job for you. But if you'll seek God in your local congregation, God can work through you and me. Praise God. God just needs someone who's available, someone who's full of the Spirit, someone who will step out by faith. It took a little teaching. It took a little encouraging. It took a little faith building. But what I'm saying is, even in our small situation with only a handful of people, none of whom had ever been used in that certain dimension, but when God got ready to move, He can find somebody through whom to move. And so we don't have to wait for a crowd of a thousand people. We don't have to wait for someone who is an expert, whom everybody knows has a certain gift. But if we ourselves will seek God where there's a need and where God wants to work, then God can work through us. That's the will of God, that we come behind in no gift. That the church in Corinth, that the church in Los Angeles, the church in Santa Maria, the church wherever you are, that that church come behind in no gift as we wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Well, anyway, that's how I look at it. And it seems to be working. Time will tell. Talk to me a few years from now and, and we'll see. But the Lord is at work. I believe it. Praise God. All right, so the gifts are available. Now, let's talk about the purpose. Why are the gifts given? Perhaps the clearest statement is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. It refers specifically to prophecy, but I'm persuaded that this principle applies to all the gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. I believe the gifts operate for these three purposes. For edification, that means the building up. Building up of the body. Building up of faith. And exhortation, that means encouragement. It could also encompass warning. But it's some kind of word that will exhort, encourage, warn, convey God's word to people so that they will respond appropriately. And then the third thing that's mentioned here is comfort. And that is lifting up people when they're discouraged. Confirming God's will and God's Word to them. Say, yes, you may think that you're off track, or you may think that you're having such a struggle that you'll never have a breakthrough. But God is here among you. God sees where you are. God will take care of you. God's on your side. And a miracle, a manifestation of a spiritual gift can have that effect. It can build up our faith. It can strengthen us when we're weak. So that's edification. It can exhort us. It can remind us of the promises of God or remind us of the judgment of God. Whatever we need to be reminded of to encourage or uh, instruct us. And then for comfort, to lift us up, to give us new strength. Now, let me say this. The purpose of the spiritual gifts is not to replace the Word of God. And it's not to replace 
godly leadership. Notice that particularly. And much of the abuse of spiritual gifts comes because people fail to acknowledge what the gifts are really for. And that, if you study the history of the latter rain movement, that was the problem there. If you study the charismatic movement, and I'm not just picking on them. There are many good things and good people in the charismatic movement, sincere people, moves of God. I don't deny that. But I'm just giving you some examples to let you know that it's true. There are abuses. Of course, there are and have been abuses, I'm sure, in our own ranks and churches from time to time. But wherever they occur, typically it's because of a failure to understand the true purpose of the spiritual gifts. It's not to replace the Word of God. You see, the Bible is God's inspired Word. The same Spirit that moves upon us in the spiritual gifts is the same Spirit that inspired the Bible. So the Spirit of God is not going to contradict or work contrary to Himself. Any supposed revelation or utterance that contradicts the written Word of God has got to be wrong. Because God is not the author of confusion. God is not a liar. God does not contradict Himself. And the Bible is the written Word of God for all people for all time. It applies to everyone. So God is not going to tell you personally something different than what He's told the whole world. And what He's told the whole world is in the Bible. So when the Bible tells us to judge the prophets, and it does say that, we are to understand that we, first of all, we compare them to the written Word of God. And no matter what kind of miracle or what kind of supposed miracle occurs, if it contradicts the Word of God, then it cannot be allowed to stand. That's the first thing. Of course, that presupposes that we have a good knowledge of the Word of God. And that's why I taught a couple of mornings ago on loving the truth. It's kind of hard to judge the operation of gifts by the Word if you don't really know the Word. But if you have a good knowledge of the Word, then you can put in context these various operations or manifestations. As I also said that a moment ago, that the spiritual gifts are not designed to replace godly leadership. God has given, we talk about spiritual gifts, but according to Ephesians chapter 4, there are some other spiritual gifts. God has given to the a church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are gifts of God for the perfecting or the equipping of the saints so that the saints can do their job in the body so that the whole body can be built up. That's a kind of a paraphrase I just gave you of Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. And so if God has given leadership in the church for the building up of the body collectively, for the maturing of the saints, for the establishment of the saints so they would not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, if He's given us pastors and teachers for that purpose, then he's not going to undermine his own work by causing spiritual gifts to uh, rebel or attack that leadership. So any supposed exercise of a spiritual gift that brings rebellion against the God-ordained leadership of the church, we know there's got to be something wrong there. Basically, I would say this. My feeling is the gifts of the Spirit are not given to tell us the will of God. Now, they may be given to confirm the will of God to us. Now, think about this in your own experience, and think about it scripturally speaking. We learn the will of God through His Word, through prayer, through the use of the mind that God has given us to reason, to think, to choose, through godly teachers that teach us the Word of God, a pastor that is the shepherd of our soul, that feeds us, that leads us. These are all scriptural terms. And so we should not look primarily for some supernatural manifestation coming out of the blue, out of nowhere, to totally transform our thinking and tell us what to do. Now what usually happens is we seek God's will. We study, we, we seek His will, we seek godly counsel, we seek the advice of the pastor... And God may confirm His will to us. God may direct us through a miracle or through a supernatural gift. But it usually comes just as that, as confirmation of a direction or a burden. It comes as a focusing of something that God has already been dealing with us in many different ways. And so I would be very hesitant if somewhere out of nowhere somebody comes to you and prophesies and says, Thus saith the Lord, you are supposed to marry you, and this one is supposed to do that, and you're supposed to go to this city. 
And that commonly happens with abuse of spiritual gifts. But the problem is they're trying to use that gift for something it was not intended to do. They're trying to replace the written word. They're trying to replace the pastor. They're trying to play, replace your own search for God and your own personal consecration and override all that with some kind of gift. That's not what the gifts are used for. Now, there have been times in my life, I remember one time I felt the Lord really leading me. And I was in a meeting, pastor came, began to pray for me, laid his hands upon me and began to prophesy. And he prophesied that the work that I was doing would be blessed, but then a new, a totally new line of ministry would open for me. And after he finished the prophecy, he said, do you know what that's talking about? I said, no, I really don't. And I, I tried to think of maybe some way it could fit, and we talked about it, but we didn't really understand it for sure. I thought that my particular area of ministry was well settled at that time. But over the course of that year, things totally changed. And a totally different avenue opened up for me. I, I believe it was the fulfillment of that prophecy. So I believe in the exercise of spiritual gifts. But what that gift did was not just overturn everything, but what it did is it, it helped confirm my thinking. It helped direct my thinking. It served as an integral part of the process. But it did not stand alone, and it did not go against the other ways that God was speaking to me. And then, at that particular time, I felt God giving me a total change of direction. I knew that I would be leaving one position in one place and going to another. I was somewhat concerned about how my wife would feel about this total change because it was such a drastic change, and, and it would, particularly in her case, it would mean leaving behind everything she knew, really. And uh, so I was a little concerned that my wife would feel the same burden that I would feel. Well, sure enough, the Lord started dealing with her in a very real way, started changing her heart, giving her a totally different burden. It was really a miraculous thing. And it seemed the Lord was just working in parallel in our lives. The culminating point came. She was talking on the phone to a very dear and trusted saint of God. And that lady began, suddenly began to speak in tongues. And then she followed it with the interpretation. And the essence was, do not fear. I will show you my will. And when you see my will, you will desire it, or you will be happy. You will know that it is the right thing for you. This lady had no knowledge or reason to know that my wife and I were thinking about a total change in our ministry. There was no way she could have known. But that little word was the clincher for my wife of saying, yes, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You will see my will and you will desire it. You will know that's the right thing. And sure enough, that's how it happened. So I believe at critical times in our lives, the gifts of the Spirit can serve as edification, exhortation, comfort. But you have to evaluate a message like that in the context of what else God is doing in your life. I could also give examples of different people that someone has come to them and told them, the Lord told me to tell you to do this and so. And it seemed to jar with everything else that they felt in their life. What do you do then? You have to judge it for yourself. You can't just go by what somebody says. You have to pray and find God's will for yourself. Does that word confirm what God is speaking to you? Or does it just seem to go against what God is speaking to you? I don't say cavalierly dismiss it, but I say consider it. But having considered it, you yourself have to be, make the decision in your own life. And you need to use all the avenues that God has given you. As I go back to say the written word, your pastor, your own conscience, your own search for God. You have to use all the avenues. Not just something coming from nowhere to find out what God is telling you in your own life. It's easy for someone else to call you to preach. It's easy for someone else to tell you whom to marry. But you're the one that has to live with that decision. You better be sure. And realize the gifts of the Spirit are not given to supersede your own search for God's will. But they're given to confirm, to encourage, to help. And if we get the purpose of the gifts in mind, they can be a great blessing to us and will not cause harm through misuse. Now, I said I'm talking about exercising the gifts in love. I think that's vital. We won't take the time to read it, but 1 Corinthians 13, if you'll look at it, it's actually put in the context of the spiritual gifts. And what it says is, 
if you exercise all the spiritual gifts and you did so without love, then everything you've achieved or done or accomplished is in vain. Notice, it says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. All right, though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge. He's actually listing or naming some of the very spiritual gifts he's introduced in chapter 12. He says, so that I have all faith. So if you had the gift of faith, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, uh, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, if you had them all rolled up in one simultaneously and exercise them, what a fantastic ministry that would be, wouldn't it? If we had a preacher come here today to exercise all those gifts in the same day, what a shouting, exciting time we would have, right? He would be in demand all across the U.S. from now till the coming of the Lord. And I'm not downgrading that, but what I'm saying is we need to make sure our priorities are right. If that exercise of ministry turns out to be mere sensationalism to build up an individual rather than the body of Christ, then it's all worthless. Even if all those gifts really did take place, even if a string of miracles really did occur, if it turns out to divide the body, to cause doctrinal confusion, to cause uh, spiritual turmoil, then it's not being operated in love. It's not worthwhile. We don't need it. Now, we need the spiritual gifts. Please do not get me wrong. But we need the spiritual gifts to be exercised in love. Love for individuals. Love for the body. If someone comes with the exercise of gifts but brings doctrinal confusion. That's very dangerous. You say, well, how could that happen? Well, I don't know all there is to know about it. It is true that sometimes people work by the power of Satan. I believe it's also true that sometimes people work by uh, trickery or, or psychological techniques. And sometimes people work by the power of God simply because God responds to faith. But that does not necessarily put a seal of approval on every aspect of their doctrine or their lifestyle. To give you a scriptural example of that, we find in Matthew chapter 7, some people that came to the Lord. At least the Lord describes people that would come to Him. Many, in, in Matthew seven twenty-two, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now, that's what they claim, but the Lord didn't say, no, you didn't. But what the Lord said, I never knew you. You may have had faith for certain manifestations, or you may have been able to preach in an inspiring way and cause faith to rise in people, and therefore I have responded to that faith. But that doesn't mean that your life was pleasing to me. Depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because you did not do the will of my Father which is in heaven. So, go back to my point. Whether it's a gift that is questionable, we question whether it really is a miracle of God, or maybe we even suspicion that someone has done it by satanic power, or whether we assume or we're confident that that person has really exercised the gift of the Spirit by the power of God in response to faith. Still, that doesn't mean we should simply swallow everything that person may stand for in their own life. We must realize that the gifts of the Spirit do not supersede God's Word. Rather, it's the other way around. And we must realize that the, the gifts must operate in love. The proper way to use these gifts is for the building up of the body. If an exercise of gifts is destructive, if it tears down another person, if it uh, tears down the doctrine, if it seeks to divide the church, if it tries to bring glory to an individual at the expense of others, then that's not operating in love, is it? And that's not the way the gifts are supposed to be operated. The gifts are to be operated in love, and they're to be operated for the benefit and the blessing of the body. That gives us a, a, good, a good idea of whether the gifts are operating correctly. You see, sometimes this, this uh, may, may trouble someone, but let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32. Maybe we can put this into perspective. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now that causes 
question in some people's mind. Let me try to explain it this way. When God gives us the Holy Spirit, and when God operates through us, He still does not violate our will. He still expects the human will to submit to God's will. And so let's say that I preach on healing this morning, and people come up in response to the Word of God. We lay hands on them, and people are healed. Now that is a miracle by the power of God, not by my power, by God's power. In response to my faith, in response to your faith, whatever it may be, in response to the Word of God, God does the work. But I can either use that gift properly or I could abuse that gift. God does not destroy my will in overriding me in exercising that miracle. It's still an interaction between me and the Spirit of God. And so if I try to build my ministry on that, if I go from here and start... Uh, The next place I go and start boasting uh, and trying to bring attention to myself of all the great healings that were done because I was there, then that is an abuse of that gift. Right? It was a real gift of God. It wasn't fake. It wasn't by demonic power. It was by God's power. But I could use it or I could abuse it. And what the Bible says is the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophet. We need to learn to use that gift properly. Now, God is not subject to us in that sense, but the working of God in our lives, in a sense, is channeled through us. God doesn't just swoop down and do the miracle without human interaction. He has chosen to use human vessels through which to operate. And so any time He uses human vessels, there's the human will that comes into play. God does not override it and make us into robots, but He says, submit your will to mine and channel that gift properly. By telling us to do it properly, it raises the possibility that we could do it improperly. And that's why He says we must subject the spirit of prophecy to that prophet. That's the way He's designed it. That's the way He's planned it. And so maybe someone feels a prophetic message coming forth or a message of tongues, an interpretation. But still, there is an appropriate time and an inappropriate time. We have the the right, you might say, or the power God has placed in our hands to channel that gift at the appropriate place and the appropriate time in the appropriate manner. Sometimes, I believe, for example, God may give a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, not so that we should immediately announce it to the whole assembly, but to give us insight as how to handle a certain situation. So the gift is given by God, but we could either use it properly or abuse it. Let's say there's a word of knowledge of God revealing some secret sin of someone. Maybe God speaks to a pastor. Well, the pastor could use that knowledge to work with that person and salvage them. Or to warn the pastor to be careful of a certain situation. But if the pastor announces it to the church on Sunday night, that may be an abuse of that gift. God didn't intend it for that way, perhaps, in that situation. So, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Just because God gives us information, or just because God works in us in a miraculous way, doesn't relieve us of our responsibility to handle it properly in the reason and the way that God has given it to us. And I go back to love. One, the, the number one guideline that will help us to know how to exercise those gifts is do it in love. Does this build up the body? Does this help an individual? Or does this hurt an individual? It's a powerful gift, but whenever there's power, power can be channeled in a good way to help or it can be channeled in an inappropriate way to hurt. And so we need to exercise the gifts in love. Too often, people that are immature and the Lord somehow moves in their midst, they try to take the credit to themselves or they try to use it to build up themselves or to tear down others. That's not how the gifts are meant to be used. 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. That doesn't mean it has to be a written schedule, a program of events, or it has to be silent worship, as some denominations try to teach. But there is a divine order and decency. In other words, the gifts should always have purpose, should always be appropriate, should always be under 
divine authority. And so if the pastor is the leader of the church, he has the authority to operate that worship service in accordance with the will of God. And so anyone that has a gift, it's fine to use it, but be sure you use it in harmony with the leadership of the church and with the leadership of the service. Let it be done decently and in order. You, but you say, but, but it's God moving. If God moves, God just, I, I just have to do it. Well, if it's God really moving upon you, God can channel it in the right way. God is not anxious. God is not frustrated. God is not impatient. If it is the Spirit of God moving upon you to speak forth or to say whatever, then He'll find a way to channel it and put it in harmony. He'll find a way to speak to the leader of the service. He'll find a way to orchestrate the whole. Because it is God's will. God is not the author of confusion. Verse 33. He wants it to be done decently and in order. So if it is God, it may be a fire shut up in your bones burning for release, but God will give you a chance to release it at the proper time in the proper manner for the benefit of everyone. If you prematurely and against authority try to exercise some gift, what good is it going to do? Even if it were of God, let's say it were a message of God, but if you disrupt everything, you cause confusion, you, you uh, create a rebellious atmosphere, then that message is not going to have its effect anyway. So as a practical matter, it's in your own best interest to operate decently and in order. Well, I hope I'm saying something that is a blessing to you today. Praise God. Not as if it was something you'd never heard of, but something that can focus our faith and help us to seek and receive spiritual gifts in the proper context. Sometimes we Pentecostals, we're supposed to be Pentecostal, but we shy away a little bit from some manifestations of the Spirit because we're afraid of abuse. Well, as is often stated, the proper antidote or remedy for abuse or misuse is not lack of use, but it's proper use. Praise God. And when we have a clear understanding of these things, we won't be so afraid of them. Even when something goes wrong, you don't have to get all uptight about it, but relax. If you have a mature congregation, you know, let, it, let it have its work. I've seen times where perhaps the, the leader of the service may have questioned or wondered if a certain message was really of God, but rather than get all excited about it and start uh, some dramatic episode, just calmly handle it smoothly, work it in. Often such things are harmless. Rarely would it be a demonic manifestation, and in such case you would take authority over it immediately. But in, in most cases, sometimes if, if there's a questionable occurrence, it might be just an error, often a sincere error, of somebody wanting to do something good but doing it in the flesh. And often the best way to handle that is to trust the maturity of the congregation. If they've been trained in the spiritual gifts, then they can handle it. But it's in, when we don't have information, when we don't know what's going on, when we're not used to the operation of God's Spirit, that, that an abuse can really become a major problem. So the more we operate in this area, the more we learn about this, the more we're comfortable with it, well, number one, it'll reduce abuses. And number two, if they do occur, it can be handled so much easier and smoothly without being worried about it. So I think it's important for us to really look at this subject. Now, let's look at the nine gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8 through verse 10. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And then verse 11, But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. The emphasis is on the one Spirit, using different individuals as he wills in different ways, but it's all the work of the Spirit of God. Now, consider this for a moment. I think... It's clear here that these are supernatural gifts, right? They're gifts of the Spirit. Now, often if you read a commentary or a lesson by someone that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, they'll try to define these in strictly human terms. They'll say the word of wisdom is when you're really smart and you can really, you know, you're really wise, you really study. 
The word of knowledge is when you're, you're, you're able to learn lots of things. And, and some even go to say that the, the uh, tongues is the ability to learn many different kind of languages and be a fluent, uh, proficient uh, linguistic expert. Well, that's ignoring the whole point of this chapter, that these are gifts of the Spirit. So, I think we understand there is a human dimension of these gifts. But this chapter is not talking about a human dimension, I say, of the gifts. But there is wisdom, all right, in the world. A sinner can be wise in certain things, isn't that right? Can, through life experience, whatever, can, can, be, can give some wise counsel in many areas of life. So there's human wisdom. All right, then, as you come into the church, you study God's Word, you live for God. There is spiritual wisdom, right? Ability to, to make wise decisions in your walk with God. But I think that this chapter is speaking of more than just human wisdom naturally acquired. It's speaking of more than spiritual wisdom in the everyday Christian life, which is imparted uh, as you walk with God, as you study God's Word. But it's talking about a supernatural endowment of wisdom at a certain point in time. Now just look at this for a moment and see if you agree. I think maybe there are three levels here. There is the natural wisdom, there is spiritual wisdom in everyday Christian living, and then there is the gift, supernatural impartation. And notice it says a word of wisdom. That underscores what I'm trying to say. It is a portion of divine wisdom. I would define the word of wisdom as a portion of divine insight or divine guidance. God doesn't give you all of His mind, but He gives you a specific piece of His mind, so to speak. He gives you wisdom for a certain situation, a certain crisis. That doesn't mean that every decision you make will be the supernatural word of wisdom. But it means at that particular time, what you've done is by the word of wisdom. Now, if you look at the other gifts, it seems to go much the same way. If you take faith, for example, I suppose in a sense, a sinner can have faith in the secular areas of life. And then there's faith that it takes to be saved and to live a Christian life. Every one of us has to have faith every day to live for God. But this chapter talks about a gift of faith. And it says not everybody has the same gift. But God gives to one this, to one that, to one that. So obviously it's not talking about the faith that every Christian has at all time to enable him to live successfully. But it's a supernatural impartation. A gift of faith. An ability to trust in God in a particular moment of crisis. So as you think about these gifts, think of it. Maybe they don't all fall into these categories, but I think many of them do. There is a natural level where a, a quality can operate in the natural realm. There is a spiritual level where they operate in every Christian's life. And then there is the supernatural gift that even supersedes what we normally experience in our daily Christian life. And I think that's a good way to look at these gifts. All right, let's go through them for just a few moments. For the sake of, of remembrance and study, often they're divided into three groups of three. And that's certainly not original with me, but uh, perhaps you know it, perhaps you don't. Anyway, it might help you to remember them. But there are three categories that we often place them in. First is the gifts of revelation. That is dealing with the mind. Maybe you can speak of it as the mind of Christ. That is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. These three can be called the gifts of revelation or the mind of Christ. And then there are three gifts of power. Faith, healing, and miracles. Those are the gifts of power or you might say the hands of Christ. Because 1 Corinthians 12 uses the analogy of the body. We are the body of Christ. So if the gifts are operating in us, it's as if the hands of Christ are being extended. And then the third category, we can call them the gifts of utterance. And that would be prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. These three are the gifts of utterance or the voice of Christ. Christ speaking miraculously through and to his church. All right. Now, let me give you what I think are the definitions. And where do I get these definitions from? From the very meanings of the words themselves and from some of the examples, particularly in the book of Acts. Different people may have slightly different definitions. That's fine. doesn't matter. 
I think they may overlap. My whole point is not that we can categorize everything precisely, but that if we have an understanding of how God works, we'll be more open to how God works. But God is not limited to these definitions. God can work in ways that we uh, can't necessarily categorize. He may move across these gifts to, to meet a certain need. And the point is not to try to figure out what name to use. The point is to be available so that can, God can use us as He wills when there's a need. But... The word of wisdom, as I've explained it, is a portion of divine insight or divine guidance. I think these gifts are oriented towards a specific situation. We always need God's guidance and God's help. But there are certain times where we seem to run into an impasse. We don't know what the answer is. Often, this may come to a pastor or a leader trying to counsel, trying to lead the church in a certain direction, facing a moment where you've got to make a choice, you've got to make a decision, and it's going to affect the future. Well, at that time, in particular, you don't just... You, you, you study the Word of God, you get counsel, but it seems you need more than just the general principles that you live by daily. At times like those, God can just seem to plant in your mind the answer, and you know that God has given you direction. It may not be immediately apparent, but God has given you guidance. It may not be, I say, immediately apparent to others. But you know in your heart, in yourself, that God has given answer to prayer. That God has given direction in a seemingly impossible situation. That God has dropped the word that you need to give to help that person that you're counseling. That is the word of wisdom. When a person does not have a natural means of knowing the right choice to make or the right decision to make. But God supernaturally imparts wisdom for that situation. Perhaps an example of that is in Acts chapter 27, verses 9 through 10. The Apostle Paul was a prisoner and the ship was getting ready to sail. And Paul warned, he said, no, even though the weather seems favorable now, we better not sail because tragedy will come. How did Paul know that? He wasn't a maritime expert. He wasn't a sailor. And no doubt the owner, the captain, laughed at him and said, everything's going fine. We're the experts. We're the ones that have done this year in and year out. We know what the currents are like and the wind is like. Everything is perfect for sailing. We're going to go. And so they went. But they shipwrecked. To me, God imparted to Paul at that time a word of wisdom. He didn't know by natural means, but God counseled with him. God gave him advice. God gave him guidance. Unfortunately, the owner of the ship wouldn't take it. But it was a word of wisdom. The ones have done this year in and year out. We know what the currents are like and the wind is like. Everything is perfect for sailing. We're going to go. And so they went. But they shipwrecked. To me, God imparted to Paul at that time a word of wisdom. He didn't know by natural means. But God counseled with him. God gave him advice. God gave him guidance. Unfortunately, the owner of the ship wouldn't take it. But it was a word of wisdom. Then there is the word of knowledge. And if wisdom is guidance or insight or direction, knowledge is information. Sometimes we say that wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge. Knowledge is having information, having facts, and wisdom is knowing how to use them appropriately. Well, there are times when God gives a word of wisdom, but there are also times when God gives a word of knowledge where that person does not have a natural means of knowing the information. But maybe it's vital to know that. Again, you can think of a counseling situation or dealing with a problem in the church or a potential problem that you don't know of. You can particularly see how God would place into the mind of the pastor. Although these gifts are not limited to the ministry, but I'm giving you some typical examples. Many pastors, probably here, can testify at different times in their ministry where they were dealing with something that they did not know about, but God supernaturally revealed the problem or supernaturally revealed a certain situation or warned them of something they were shortly going to face. A word of knowledge. Sometimes it's given to share. Sometimes it's given to keep secret, but to know that information and to operate appropriately. An example of the word of knowledge would be in Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira conspired to hold back part of the money. That was not sin to hold back part of the money, but it was sin to lie about it and to represent themselves as fully cooperating with the church when they really weren't. 
So they came to the apostle Peter and gave this offering as if it were the total price of the land. It was a lie. The apostle Peter looked at them and said, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. How did he know that? There's no indication from the story that he had investigated the situation and found out by natural means. But it seems rather obvious that the Holy Spirit imparted this information to him. You've lied to the Spirit, and the Spirit has told me what you did. A word of knowledge. And then the third gift that we often classify under the gifts of Revelation is the discerning of spirits. To discern means to judge between. The discerning of spirits, I believe, is the ability to distinguish the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Satan, or the human spirit. Basically, there are three kinds of spirits at operation in this world. There's God and the angels, the devil and the demons, and then there's the human spirit. And we shouldn't overlook that third possibility. But the discerning of spirits enables someone to tell at a particular time whether a certain action comes from God, whether it comes from the devil, or whether it just comes from the human spirit. And furthermore, the discerning of spirits may enable a person to tell the motive by which something is done. A lying spirit, deceitful spirit, adulterous spirit. Uh, the discernment of spirits enables the person to find out what's happening. What is the inner motivation behind a certain action? That can be very important at certain times to know really what's going on. It comes to my mind, Acts chapter 16. Do you remember when Paul uh, was preaching? Paul and his company were traveling and there was a woman that had a spirit of divination a fortune teller and she started following them around and let's see if I can find it yes these men are the servants of the most high God which show unto us the way of salvation this is in Philippi she was calling out as they went around the city these people are of God you need to listen to them well at first glance, that sounds like a commendation. You know, maybe the Apostle Paul would be appreciative that someone was drawing attention to him and to the truth of his message. But actually, it was a trick of the devil. This woman was well known in the town as a fortune teller, having an evil spirit, no doubt worshiping the gods of that time and place. And so for her to give a commendation to Paul actually put him in the same category as her and would discredit his message would make him seem in the eyes of the people to be allied with her spirit. If Paul did not know what was going on, that tactic could have easily discredited him among the Jews, among the people who are God-fearers, among people who are seeking truth about the one God. But Paul discerned in his spirit that this was not merely the praise of a human, that this was not someone who was repenting and coming to an acknowledgement of the truth, but this was actually a mocking uh, tactic motivated by an evil spirit. And so Paul, being grieved, turned and finally said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. There's an example of the discerning of spirits which leads to the casting out of spirits. It was very important at that time for him to know whether this was of God, whether this woman was supporting the work of God, or whether it was actually a demonic influence. And there are times when we need to know in our own lives, in our own church, we encounter certain situations. We've got to know, is this a trick of the devil? Is somebody speaking under the influence of Satan? Is this, is this uh, something of a carnal human spirit? Or is God working in this situation? And I say we shouldn't neglect the role of the human spirit. Sometimes people assume it's either God or the devil. Not necessarily. You know, somebody may give a prophecy and, and we feel it's wrong. If we immediately accuse them of operating by the power of Satan, we could destroy a sincere but maybe immature or misguided person. We need to recognize that sometimes when things go wrong, I'm sure the devil capitalizes on everything he can but many times when things go wrong it's simply immaturity carnality the flesh lack of understanding and when it's that motivation we need to treat it as such treat that person with with kindness and help and uh, further instruction at the in the appropriate way in the appropriate time otherwise if we misjudge the situation we could do much more damage than help i remember one time 
pastor of one of our large churches was telling me that a man came in the service and came to the altar, began praying, or at least supposedly, but, but uh, he started causing quite a confusion and emotion. People gathered around and he started kicking and yelling and screaming and throwing his hands. And so some of the men grabbed him, began casting the demon out of him. And uh, the more they grabbed and the more they tried to hold him back and the more they rebuked him, the, the more violent he got. It was really uncontrollable. And this went on for some time, disrupting the altar service, and no one could seem to cast out the demon or control this man. Finally, the pastor went down, whispered in his ear, just a quiet prayer, or whatever it was, and the man just instantly grew still. Straightened up, and a few minutes later, he just walked out of the service. So after the service, some of the men came around the pastor, marveling at his spiritual insight and power where no one else could cast the demon out just with a simple word. He was able to take control over the situation. He said, what? What did you say? How did you pray? What did you do to get control over this man? The pastor laughed and he said, I knew that situation. He said, I just whispered in his ear, if you don't stop acting up like this, I'm calling the police right now. He knew it wasn't an evil spirit. He knew it was just a man in his flesh trying to draw attention to himself. Well... No doubt the devil was laughing at all those people trying to cast out the demon. He was having success in disrupting the service and disrupting the altar call. But someone that had some insight, knew what was going on, was able to handle the situation. Well, I'm not saying you can always handle it that way, but I'm saying we need to discern what God is doing, we need to discern what the devil is doing, and we need to discern what the flesh is doing. And sometimes there's an interaction between the flesh and the devil, and we need to discern and handle the situation appropriately. Praise God. And then the second set of gifts, the gifts of power. There's faith. And as I said, we all need faith. And we wouldn't even be here if we didn't have faith today. But you know, sometimes you get in a situation where you see no way out. It's just discouragement. It doesn't seem to be an answer. It doesn't seem. And, and you're walking by faith. You haven't backslidden. You haven't cursed God and died. But still... You can't seem to get the answer. You can't seem to get the victory. But God can intervene miraculously. And I believe it's appropriate to pray and say, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Lord, I'm walking by faith, but I need something extra. I need you to impart the gift of faith to me. I can't make it. I don't know which way to go. But Lord, lift me up on the wings of faith. And God can intervene with the supernatural gift of divine trust to lift you up above that situation that before you couldn't seem to rise above or see over. The gift of faith. Going back to the story of the shipwreck, the Apostle Paul, Acts 27. It seemed hopeless. The ship was breaking up. People lost all hope of being saved. They threw everything overboard to lighten the load, but still the ship was going to be destroyed. There was no hope of anybody surviving. But an angel of God appeared to Paul in the middle of the night and said, don't worry, God is going to give you, the life of every person on board. And so the Apostle Paul stood up in that hopeless situation. There seemingly was no logical way of escape or deliverance. But he said, Sirs, be of good cheer. Everything's going to be all right. We're going to all be saved. For I believe God that it's going to be just as it was told me. He stood up and said, I believe God. In a hopeless situation, the gift of faith was operative. Maybe it will come by an angelic visitation. Maybe not. But however it comes, it gives you faith. You know that God is going to see you through. You know that God is going to work a miracle. There's no proof. There's no objective evidence. Nobody else seems to think so. The circumstances don't seem to allow it. But faith rises and faith speaks. And you say, everything is going to be all right. Praise God. The gift of faith. Praise God. I've seen, I believe... That more than once in my own parents' lives when certain situations seemed hopeless. I know one occasion when they were actually bodily picked up and thrown out of a church by people that were trying to stop the preaching of the oneness of God. But my mother later told me, even though she fell onto the frozen ground and was hurt, my dad's toe was broken in the incident. He was preaching and they just took him by his tie and started grabbing him, twisting it, knocked him down, knocked the pulpit on top of him, started beating some of the people with a microphone stand and so on. So as they were bodily ejected from the building, my mother stood up and said, you know, 
I feel like just shouting up and down this whole street. No logical reason, but she felt even in the persecution, despite the persecution, because of the persecution, God is going to give us victory. We're not going to be destroyed, but the message is going to go on. It's got to be a gift of faith, I believe, to rise up above the circumstances and feel the confidence that God is going to bring victory. There are the gifts of healing. Notice, that's in the plural, if you look in 1 Corinthians 12. The gifts of healing. Why plural? Well, maybe because there are many kinds of healing. There are many kinds of disease, many kinds of handicap. And I think God is trying to tell us, whatever the situation, no matter how unusual or unique or different, there is a gift of healing for that situation. Gifts of healing in the church. There's... On a natural level, there is healing in the body, isn't there? If you cut your hand, it's not too severe. The body is capable of rejuvenating and healing itself. And I believe that's a gift of God, too, because, after all, God designed our bodies. But this is talking about a supernatural intervention where God steps on the scene. Maybe the body can't function right, but God touches it and miraculously heals it. Maybe it's instantaneous where we see instantly the change. Or maybe God touches some internal organ or some system of the body and gets it working right and then leaves it to the body to start functioning and start healing itself. And so we perceive the healing as gradual because God just gets the body back on track and lets it take over and resume its normal function. But whether it's instant or gradual, I believe we should give God the glory. Praise God. Now, I don't think that stands against doctors and, and medicines, because after all, what is medicine but substances that come from God's creation? Even those that are synthetically manufactured, they're based on God's creation. And what are doctors except people who are skilled in helping the body to heal itself? The doctor can't heal you. The doctor can give you advice of how to use the body properly. And isn't that the problem with a lot of sickness today? Is we're not using it according to God's rules when He created the body. If we get somebody to teach us how to handle it properly, we can solve a lot of problems. And in fact, it's kind of hard to have a lot of faith when, uh, for healing when you're abusing the body and you're the problem, the reason why it's not working right. I suppose we can still pray for God to help us, but we'd have a little more confidence if we were being good stewards at the same time. But the doctor can't heal. He can only try to help the body get it back on track. Ultimately, I believe healing is from God. I believe that our faith should be in God and not in the doctors and the medicine. I believe we should take every situation to God, give it to Him first and foremost and continuously. And if God heals instantaneously, that's what we want and desire. But if God does not heal instantaneously, I don't think there's anything wrong with examining our own selves to see if we might be the cause of the continuing problem. Going to the doctor to see if there might be some cause. Getting the doctor to try to help get the body back on track. And at the same time, we're still trusting God for healing. Even if you go undergo that operation, actually you appreciate what the doctor's doing, but you know by the doctor cutting out something of your body, that doesn't heal the body. But you still need God to heal. You're trusting Him for healing. I believe our trust must be in God. I do think we have a danger in our Western society of depending upon medicines and doctors too much. I think we should trust God. Maybe a lot of stuff we take, actually we don't need to take, and actually might do more harm than good in the long run. But if we put our trust in God first and foremost, give God a chance to work, we would see the gifts of healing in operation even more, perhaps, than we do at times. And then there's the working of miracles. Acts uh, chapter 20 may be one example of that. A miracle, I believe, is a divine intervention in the course of nature. It's not a violation of the laws of nature because what are the laws of nature except the way the world works that God created? If God created the world to work that way and then He decides to do something, he, He's not breaking any law. He's just working in His world. But nevertheless, we perceive it as an exception to the rules or not a breaking of the rules but a transcending of the normal rules of operation. And so that's maybe what we can see as a miracle, a direct intervention of God, a transcending of natural law as we perceive them. God intervening, not necessarily a healing of the body, but there are many kinds of miraculous answers to prayer that many of us can testify to. There is the working of miracles. 
Acts chapter 20 talks about a young man that I guess Paul preached too long and the guy fell asleep. Eutychus fell out the window, broke his neck. Paul raised him up. It's not just a healing. That was a miracle. <laughs> Praise God. I believe in miracles today, don't you? Time doesn't permit me to give personal illustrations of some of these, but I can say that either in my own ministry or in my parents' ministry, I think I could say every one of these gifts of the Spirit, I can personally attest that they're not just for the book of Acts, but they're for us today. Amen. And then the final three, the gifts of utterance. To uh, briefly handle these, there's prophecy, and then there is tongues and interpretation. And it seems that tongues and interpretation taken together have essentially the same impact as prophecy. Now, I believe there's prophecy in a, a general sense that every inspired utterance is a prophecy in a more general sense. Revelation 19 and 10 says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So anytime a preacher preaches under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, anytime somebody testifies to the gospel of Jesus Christ under the anointing of Spirit, anytime someone gives a home Bible study under the anointing of the Spirit, in a sense, that is prophecy. As, as Romans 12, we talked about that yesterday, the service gifts. of If you, if you uh, have the gift of prophecy, then prophesy according to the proportion of faith. I think probably that's where that fits in the general category of an inspired utterance. But here in 1 Corinthians 12, I think we're going beyond the prophecy that, that we think of as preaching or teaching under the anointing. But it's actually talking about a supernatural message that's imparted at a certain time. And I think it could be, it doesn't have to relate to the future, by the way. Prophecy, the very word prophecy, we think of it as always future, but it does not have to be future. It's a divine message, a divine utterance. That's the literal definition of it. It may or may not relate to the future. Sometimes I believe it can happen in the course of a preacher's message. This has happened in my own ministry, that I may be preaching under the anointing. The, hopefully the whole message is under the anointing of God and, and presenting the Word of God. But something I will say, and maybe I will realize it, or maybe I will not even fully realize it. But in that message, God will somehow begin to direct a word to somebody right there. And maybe the preacher knows who it is, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he knows what's happening, maybe he doesn't really know at that time. But God somehow sends a dart right straight to the heart of someone and gives them a personal word. I've seen that happen, where somebody would come up and say, what you have preached actually is exactly what I was feeling or what I was wrestling with or what I had been talking about with my friend. It was a prophecy to me. And then sometimes God will cause a person to stand in the congregation and give forth a message in the known language, in our case in English. And that would be a prophecy. Then, but let me say, when God gives a prophecy, the Bible, 1 Corinthians 14, says we are to judge. Not critically, we shouldn't stand in criticism. I believe when an utterance comes forth, we should be open and receptive to it. But at the same time, we need to think, make sure it corresponds with the Word of God and corresponds with our experience. There is a very interesting example I will share with you briefly. I know that time is running out, but maybe this will help. In, in Acts chapter 21, there was a prophecy given to the Apostle Paul. He was on his way to Jerusalem. And notice, in chapter 21 of Acts, verse 4, And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And then verse 10, As we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus, Verse 11, And when he was come, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. But Paul went anyway, and I believe he went in the will of God. Now notice, I believe probably both prophecies were parallel. The prophecy was, if you go to Jerusalem, Something bad is going to happen. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be imprisoned. And so the actual prophecy, the word from God, was this is going to happen to you, Paul. But what the prophets themselves and the companions of Paul, they jumped to conclusions. Having gotten that word, their conclusion was, well, obviously, Paul, you don't want to be imprisoned. You don't want to be hurt. None of us want that. So God is telling you not to go. 
But the actual word of prophecy from God was not, don't go to Jerusalem. The actual word was, this awaits you if you go. And God's purpose was to prepare Paul so he would make the consecration, so he would know what was ahead, so that when he was arrested, he would not lose confidence in God as if God had failed, but so that when he was arrested, he would know this was all in the plan. Don't worry, I'm still with you. Now, the point here is, somebody may give a prophecy, but ultimately only you can apply it to your life. The person that gives the prophecy may be well-meaning, but misapply it if, if they were to try to counsel you about it. So when the prophecy goes forth, you don't have to deny it's of God, but even considering that it is from God, somebody else can't apply it to you. You yourself have to be the determining factor to know what God is speaking to you. Nobody else can know for you. And so the prophecy is of God in this case, but Paul still had to make the decision as to what it meant, and his decision was contrary to what everybody else, including the prophets themselves, thought it meant. Now that's an interesting application, but that shows how the gifts of the Spirit need to operate. That shows us that when we do operate a gift, we need to be careful to keep it in the realm of the Spirit and not interject our personal influence And then when we receive some gift, some utterance, we need also to judge and evaluate how it applies in our own lives. Then let me just briefly say about tongues and interpretation. There are regulations there in 1 Corinthians 14. I I don't have time to go into them. But let me just point this out to you. Often people who do not believe in the Holy Ghost will try to use the regulations of 1 Corinthians 14 to deny the importance of tongues. Or they'll use the statement in 1 Corinthians 12, Do all speak with tongues? No, all don't speak with tongues. But the point is, this is talking about the gift of tongues in operation in the church. Now, if you study 1 Corinthians 14, you find there is tongues for personal edification. And then there's tongues as a public message. The rules relate to tongues as a public message. If you speak in tongues, there should be an interpretation. If there's no interpretation, be silent. But you can still pray to yourself and to God. You can still have devotional tongues in the church. But don't interrupt and dominate the service with messages in tongues that are not interpreted. And if there are such messages, let there be at most two or three. That's enough. After that, the miraculous sign, which is given for the unbelievers in the audience, that has done its work. And from then on, there needs to be something that they can understand and edify them and benefit them. And so, but these regulations do not relate to receiving the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Because notice, in the book of Acts, when people received the Holy Spirit, the 120 received it at one time, there was 120 speaking in tongues all at once. They didn't wait for two or three. They didn't wait for an interpreter. They didn't keep silent. It's a different situation. All the accounts in the book of Acts are talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and tongues as initial evidence. So, there are three uses of uses of tongues that we can see in the Scripture. The initial evidence of the Holy Spirit, the personal and devotional tongues, where Paul said, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with the understanding. I'll pray in the Spirit. I'll pray in the understanding. I'll, I'll do that all. Pray to yourself and to God. It edifies you. All that is talking about devotional tongues. When you pray, when we worship together at the altar call, whenever we're all devotionally worshiping God, tongues is appropriate. But then the third use is the public message. And that's where it needs to be regulated and we need the interpretation to follow. Sometimes there seems that there is no interpretation. Maybe God is trying to use someone and and they're not totally open. But I have seen cases where even though the message was not given, the effect was still there. I was in one service where we'd invited a student from Lebanon There was a message in tongues. We all waited for the interpretation and were somewhat disappointed when it never came. But you know, that student from Lebanon came up after service and said, Why did you have that person speak to me? Why did you have them stand up and speak in my language? And we explained to him, we didn't, that person doesn't even know your language or didn't even know it was to you. But that message was to him and he heard it and he understood it. It wasn't a failure at all. It was God was working in an unusual way. And in the same service, there was another lady. She was Catholic. She had heard about Pentecost, but never really... She, she came to that service. She said, I always wanted actually to hear someone speak in tongues to see what it was. Well, she heard it that night. So I, I saw how God was working in that way, even though we didn't really understand what He was doing. So don't underestimate how God can work in various ways 
through the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Well, there are many more things we could say about this, but I want to go back to my theme today, and that is exercising the gifts in love. If we will earnestly seek the gifts, don't just look at them as something God may do somewhere sometime, but why don't we earnestly get a burden? Lord, use me in whatever way you want. Lord, use my church in whatever way you want. Lord, we need revival. You know why it's so important? Let me just read this from Hebrews chapter 2. Let me show you why the gifts are so important. Hebrews 2 and 4. God also bearing them witness. Talking about the people that preach the gospel. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. We need the gifts of the Spirit in operation to confirm God's Word. If we want revival, if we want a miraculous ingathering a harvest of souls, we need the gifts of the Spirit in the local church. So let's covet, desire, seek earnestly the best gifts, the gifts that are needed, the gifts that will help, the gifts that will be appropriate at any time. But recognize they are according to God's will, not our will. I question people that, that go to seminars to, to, uh, to get a personal prophecy. I saw an ad one time, if you come to this seminar, we'll teach you how to prophesy and we will give you a personal prophecy. Where is God's will in that? You see, I'm not so much concerned about having taught this lesson. Somebody comes up to me and, okay, give me a prophecy. No, that, that, that would be my will. And that's the problem if you sensationalize the gifts and say, well, here's so-and-so, I have the gift of prophecy, I'm going to come with a series of meetings on the gift of prophecy. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying if we put pressure on a preacher like that, what if God chooses not to exercise that gift that particular occasion? We put pressure on that guy to come up with something anyway. Don't we? And you hear about abuses. Some of these uh, televangelists and uh, this one guy, they, they caught him with a transistor in his ear that his wife was uh, interviewing people as they came in the tent and whispering to him what, what was going on. And he was coming back with a word of wisdom or a word of prophecy or whatever it is and uh, telling people what was wrong with him. Now, I believe God can generally work that way. But what I'm saying is, let's not sensationalize it. Let's do it according to God's will. Our ministry, our meetings should not be focused on a certain gift. I thank God for healing, but the healing crusade should be to lead people to Jesus Christ to receive the Holy Spirit. I thank God if He gives a word of knowledge and speaks prophetically. But I want to know what are the results. Is the result of that meeting just to build up the name of an individual so that he can go on to, to bring crowds so that they can see some spectacular manifestation? Or how many people have received the Holy Spirit? How many people have been strengthened in their Christian walk? How many people have become more faithful to the local church because of the gifts of the Spirit? And if they cause people not to be faithful to the local church, if they detract from people receiving the Spirit and being saved, then it seems like we're not operating the gifts in love. We're not operating them according to God's purpose. We're not doing them according to God's will, but according to our will. Seek the gifts, I say, but let's seek them in love. And let's operate them according to God's will. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Let's stand and let's thank God for the gifts of the Spirit that He's placed in His church. Let's thank Him for the miracle-working power of God in our midst. Praise the Lord. second type of prayer is a current prayer. He said a current prayer is the second type of prayer that God answers. It's, it's a situation that you do not have, you don't have a long time for God to do this. You need God to do it now. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, you can have a lost loved one. You can, that's a memorial thing. You just pray until God does something, but you could have a situation where you need God to intervene now. And when you have that type of prayer, memorial prayer is not what you need. You can't just go bring the name up or bring the situation up in passing and say, God, I'm making another payment on this. I need you to come through. When the situation is desperate, it requires desperation in your prayers. A current prayer. You can't come with a situation, Brother Grant, that's tragic and real and severe and come to God and give God a, you know, Lord, what we're going through right now. And I need you to come through because the deadline is this week and we have to an answer. We need some peace. We need a miracle and walk out. That's, there's no desperation there. You're giving God the right facts, but you're not giving God the heart behind the facts. You're showing God, I'm really not serious about this. 
because a current prayer requires desperation. It requires you to be, I need an answer now. I don't have 60 years to pray about this. We need a miracle in our house. That is desperation. That's a current prayer. And a current prayer, God will hear. And I want to show you something, that, that the Lord answers prayers while you're praying them. I know that we've got God in this box that if I pray today, he can come through by Thursday or he can come through by tomorrow. He can come through by next month. But actually God, the Bible said, I can hear you before you and say what you're going to say. In fact, I need Jesus. I know what you're saying before you even ask.